Ladies and gents, good afternoon, early evening, whatever it is. My name is Simon Brown, uh, founder of Just One Lap, doing this evening's presentation. So as we've done every year for the last four or five years, we gather here at the JSC, we talk about, well, I talk about what I think is going to be happening next year. Um, and I preface it always by saying that point from Buffett, which is, in truth, predictions tell you more about the person making them. Um, the, 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 the secret on predictions is that typically you just assume that current trends continue because they usually do continue. The hard part about predictions is when you say trends will change. That, that's the really, really, really risky part. So if you want to make a whole bunch of predictions, see what happened this year, say it will happen next year, and much of it will be right. But as Buffett would tell you, this is going to tell you a lot more about me, perhaps, than about the market. Key point is, and I'll get to that slide in a few minutes, in, in a few moments, is I will go back to my last year's predictions. I'm not going to throw them out into the ether and then hope everyone forgets. We will mark me, and, and, and I'll you know, I, I usually do fairly well. When I, mean, I do really, really badly, maybe we'll know because someone else will be standing up here in the first week of December and giving the predictions. So every year on Twitter, I ask my followers to tell us what they think the market will do the following year. Last year, they called for this year to be green. Um, and this year, they're calling for next year to be green. Oddly enough, my Twitter followers every year have got it right. Wisdom of the crowds. Uh, ask what I think, what they think the market will do next year, they get it right. That poll is still live uh, until tomorrow morning. So if you go to Twitter, it's my pinned tweet, Simon PB. If you think that's right or wrong, you can go and have your five cents at the same time. But certainly the consensus view is that top 40 will be green in 2018. 2018. Ponder that a moment. Eh? The, the old folks here still remember like when 1998 was, I remember when 1988 was an exciting year. So my 2017 predictions, a year ago, I stood up here and gave my predictions. And truth, last year was easy because two years ago, I stood up here and gave predictions. And 48 hours later, then finance minister and Klankainene got fired. Um, and that really threw us a curveball. Uh, a year ago, hey, there was like, it took him at least three months to fire a minister, which gave me a whole bunch of space to get right. <clears throat> So here's what I said for last year. Ran stronger. Yes, I looked for top 40 higher. I said 55,000. We tagged it. We below it, but we got it right. I said no recession. We had a recession. It was short. It was sharp, uh, but it was a recession. And short answer is our economy has been under serious pressure uh, and notwithstanding perhaps some green shoots in the GDP numbers on Tuesday, we remain largely under pressure. I said downgrades were coming. We're not yet all the way there. Uh, Moody's is still pondering. The point is Moody's is always, Fitch is the one no one cares about. And Moody's is the one that's always late to the party. Um, and then S&P kind of floats, I suppose, in the middle of somewhere there. So Moody's is the last standout that is holding us from full on junk status. At the moment, we are kind of quasi junk status, whatever that really means. Um, I said, are we Brazil? And I'll come back to that point in a moment. But the answer to that is yes. I said the rains would return. And if you're not in Cape Town, they have. If you are in Cape Town, sorry, not sorry. Um, I said buy fruit producers. I really thought, you know, the, I'm a simple look, right? I'm from Durban. I looked at the scenario. I said rain returns by fruit producers. How hard can that be? Well, it turned out the rain did return and fruit producers were a mixed bag. Some did better, uh, Astro did nicely, uh, some did very poorly. It was more of a mixed bag than I anticipated. And I'm going to talk more about that in a moment, so we'll park that there. I was very bullish on the Indy 25, which did well. I was bearish on the Finney 15, which also did all right, so I was wrong on that one. Um, I thought oil would be range-bound, largely correct. I thought that we wouldn't have any rate changes locally. We did. And then U.S. and the EU were largely moving, uh, EU unchanged, U.S. moving higher. So not a heck lot of surprises there. Nothing particularly rocket science there. The, the one I took the most flack for a year ago was I said that the top 40 would go higher and the RAND will go stronger. I'm going to come back to those two in a little more detail in a moment. I also said that the U.S. bull market will continue, uh, and it is. It is now the second longest in terms of duration and the second biggest in terms of gain ever. Um, and whilst being second is nice, you know, I think we should be first. I think, you know, wh wh why can't it be the biggest? But I'm going to come back to that. So we'll park that there for a moment as well. These are in particular the stocks that I said that we should look for for, for uh, 2017. Um, I liked the what was then Deutsche Bank is now Signia, the worldwide ETF. I like ETFs. I like the worldwide. It gives you some currency exposure, which didn't help much this year. I like the equal weight. Uh, 
uh, uh, quantum f food. They were my my two food producers was Tongot, which I had and bailed on eventually. My Tongot story was simple, right? There are three parts to Tongot. Starch. Expect that to be largely unexciting. Uh, uh, property. Expect that to be lumpy. Goes good, goes down. But property is a slow process, so lumpy. And sugar. Well, expect production to come uh, and therefore boost it from that way. I was frankly looking for 150, 160 price target on Tongot. I managed to escape at a break-even price before costs, thanks to dividend. But over the last 12 months, Tongot has given us a negative return. I exited a couple of weeks ago when they put out that trading statement, which basically said that starch is doing poorly, that sugar is doing poorly, and property is doing great. And I'm like, okay, so I'm wrong on two out of three and you take the money and run. So I, I've bailed my, 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 my tongue out. The other one did very nicely for us. Those numbers include dividends over the course of the year. ShopRite, and I have exited now, I've taken my money. ShopRite is a perennial favorite. We have to eat. The rich people can go to Woolies, uh, and when they're not so rich, they go to ShopRite. The poor people go to Checkers. Uh, the very poor people go to YouSave. Uh, ShopRite has got this cornered. If you look at global food retailers with more than 1,000 stores, so really big retailers, and you look at any metric that you want, you can do uh, 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 operating margins. You can do distribution center efficiencies, uh, sales per square meter, sales per staff member. You pick any metric. ShopRite is usually number one, and if it's not, it's number two. ShopRite is the best food retailer on planet Earth. We should own it. It's just that simple. I'll come back to it in a bit. Um, what's that other red one there? Woolies. Yeah, so Woolies was my big head on a block trade for 2017. So it's only down 3% if I take the dividends into account since this time last year, although it, it ran nicely and then pulled back again. Um, the Willie story was, was quite simple, and uh, we got it wrong for a very, very simple reason, Australia. At least we, do we still beat them at the cricket? Because we don't beat them at the rugby. <clears throat> Australia was was the problem there. The, 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 the tough times in, in South Africa for Willys, there's no surprise, saw that coming. A year ago, Willys was priced on a PE, an evaluation that we had last saw in March of 2009, 2009. In other words, at the end of the financial crisis when the stock was in, I think it was like eight rand or something like that. Those were the valuations we were looking at for Willys. What caught me the curveball was I didn't expect profitability on Willys to go backwards. That was the surprise. I thought that their HEPs growth would be somewhere between zero and plus eight percent. Turned out it was somewhere between zero and minus a number. Um, and that is Australia. And there's a there's a there's a there's a side story to that. And that side story is quite simple. Big mergers and acquisitions are good for lawyers and CEO egos and nothing else. And my challenge to you is to name me some large mergers and acquisitions that worked. And there's two you can't name because I know them already. SAB Miller, BHP Billiton. They worked. What others? I'm not going to wait. You can mail me later and tell me. Mergers and acquisitions fail. The only people who make money are the lawyers because the lawyers charge by the hour. They don't own shares. Lesson learned. Billiton, 8%, hardly exciting. Top 40, 20 3%, including dividends over the last 12 months. That is a stonking return. Considering that the previous three years, our returns were plus two, minus two. I mean, we, we, we did nothing. This is our first proper year of top 40 return and helped by a little bit of a sell-off for the late last year. So you know, it, it dragged it down. But nonetheless, 23% on the top 40, including your dividends, really, really nice. The truth of the story behind that, of course, is thank you, Naspass, and thank you, Richmond. Um, you know what? I, I, I don't own Naspass. I do own Richmond, and I'm not really fussy where my returns come from. You know, people are like, oh, but you only made money because of Naspass. I'm like, yeah, but I made money. So it's because of Naspass. Uh, okay, but I made money. This is what I'm in the game for, to make the money. Now, that brings risks, absolutely. So there are four burning questions that you have this evening, and I'm going to answer them up front, because you're not going to listen to me properly until I answer those first four burning questions. <laughs> 
This chart is out of date because I took it yesterday when Steinhoff was 15 rand and 70 cents. It is now 30% lower. It is now 10 rand and some cents. How many cents, frankly, doesn't matter. Steinhoff's story is really, really easy. We now know we know nothing. I'm deadly serious. Well, that's not true. They gave us a sense this morning and said that it seems like maybe there's six billion, with a B, euros, with an E, missing. We round that up to approximately 100 billion rand, give or take a few billions. 100 billion rand missing. That's not oops. <laughs> oops is when I spill my Coke. You know, this is, I've just broken a case of wine type of tragedy. This is the real McCoy. And, and, and this, this hundred billion rand that they have discovered is missing. They discovered in like one day. So the question is, what else is missing? The answer, we know nothing. My view on Steinhoff is really quite simple. The game is over. It's, it's tragic, it's horrible, it's many, many things. Uh, Marcus Huster, some, someone said to me once, Marcus Huster, if, if, accounting, if accounting was an Olympic sport, Marcus Huster would win gold every time. Except maybe he was doping. <laughs> it turns out he was the Ben Johnson. Call it what it is. It's fraud. It's corruption. It is, it is you know, and the problem that Steinhoff has Ironically, the 100 billion rand hole is not their biggest problem. Their problem is reputation. Who in this room is going to think that Steinhoff is a brilliant investment? You might think it's a punt, but do you think it's a brilliant investment? Do you think this is the best management team that, that, that the planet Earth has ever seen? Do you think that Marcus Just is an Olympic chartered accountant? No. You have one of two positions. You hold Steinhoff and you hate him, and you don't hold Steinhoff and you're like, oh, but that was close. <laughs> Next lesson, and, and, and uh, Magda from Signia tweet uh, MoneyWeb today. The next lesson is, is that far too many analysts out there were like, well, I don't really understand it, but hey, we trust Marcus. That is not an investment strategy either. I remember trying to understand uh, Steinhoff many years ago, and I, my simple thing is try to work out what the debt is. And I spent an hour on it, and I'm not the smartest balance sheet man in the, in the world. Um, I'm not even in the top half of smartness. But after one hour, I had no idea what their debt was. And I'm like, ah, sorry, next, move on. Steinhoff, it, it might survive. I'm not convinced it does. Um, and if it ever gets back to 100, I'm going to be a, like way, 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 way older than I am right now. It's a disaster. EOH, I don't know what happened. EOH at some point today was down 40%, an absolute collapse. It's down from 180 to 40 odd bucks. I don't know what's happening. There's no news out there in particular. I don't know where it closed today. The point is the market is just hating on EOH. And you can agree or disagree with it. Uh, at this point, the market is just saying, don't like. EOH's biggest problem is how do they expand their business? By acquisition and by organic. The organic growth is fine. It gets harder and harder as you get bigger and bigger. The problem is acquisitive growth. As you get bigger and bigger, acquisitive growth gets harder because you can't find those big enough businesses to actually make a dent in your profits. So their profit was always going to drop. Their HEPs growth was always going to drop from 30 25% per year growth down to 10 12% growth and settle it around that point. But that means it's probably fairly valued at about 100 rand. At this point, their problem is if EOH knocks on your door right now and says, we want to buy your company and we will pay you with shares, you're like, I don't want to sell my company. Whereas if they'd come to you at that point and said, I want to buy your company, here are shares, people were like, sure, I'll take your shares. I don't know where this game goes. I don't know what's happening here. I don't know what the story is at the moment. All we had yesterday and to a greater degree today was classic, good old fashioned fear, panic, head to the exits at all costs. Yesterday morning in the opening auction on Steinhoff, at one point there were 12 million shares on offer at market. In other words, people are saying, any price we don't care, get me out. At one point, the opening price for Steinhoff was one cent because there were so many sellers. One cent. And then eventually it, well, uh, that's hardly any consolation what's happened to that chart there. Uh, NASPASS. 
The question in everyone's lips is NASPAS going to 5,000 Rand? The answer is yes. Is it going to be next year? Nah. If not next, certainly 2019. So NASPAS at the moment is all the heat around ANN7, all the heat around multi-choice, all the heat around Guptas, all of that story happening out there. Were they involved in implicit in state capture and all of that? I, I honestly don't know. What I do know is that for a company like NASPAS or multi-choice in particular, to go to somebody, a competitor, and say, here's 100 million rand, please help us pressure the government, is what capitalists do. In America, they call it lobbying. And in fact, you register as a lobbyist. Now, we can say this is unethical, and, and, but it's what capitalists do. Did they take ANN7 and pay them over the, over the price so that ANN7 could perhaps put pressure on the government to, get, to make sure that the digital uh, stuff is not encrypted? Hey, maybe. For them, it's a good business. They don't want encrypted uh, set-top boxes. And if it's going to cost them 150 or 250 million a year, they're going to pay it. We can have that debate. This, to my mind, is capitalism, and it may or may not be state capture. The class action suit in America is largely irrelevant. That The particular company does class action suits. It's their speciality. About one in 50 gets off the ground. About one in 200 pays off, but they chance their luck. It might go down the line. Who knows? The truth about NASPASS is it's about 10 cent. In truth, everything else will blow over. It's about 10 cent. Understand that 10 cent is dominant in China. I, I was reading, a, a, in fact, I wasn't reading, I was listening to a blog, some woman who just spent six months in China, and she did everything within WeChat. So she finds a place to live in WeChat. She pays her deposit in WeChat. She signs the lease in WeChat. She orders a taxi cab in WeChat. Remember that Uber left China because the WeChat equivalent of Uber was eating their lunch. And the biggest thing with China is what they call the Great Firewall of China, is that the Chinese government has stopped competition. There is no Facebook. There is no Twitter. There never will be. Well, never say never. But yeah, the Chinese government is not going to let Facebook in. It's not going to let Twitter in. So in essence, what, what Tencent has is a protected monopoly. But that's fine because their base is 1.3 billion emerging people. That's a big enough base. Tencent is real. It makes profit. It's the real thing. It is an insane business. And currently, at 3,000, call it 500 rand, uh, NASPASS is reflecting about 70% of the 10 cent price. Will 10 cent carry on rising? Short answer, no reason why not. It's not massively stretched on a valuation level, and it continues to deliver the goods and make the profits. Absolutely, it does. If that happens, at some point, NASPASS will stop it. I mean, I'm not sure if we can call that a correction. I mean, technically, it is. It's more than 10% down. But at some point, NASPASS will carry its journey. I don't think we're going to have another 100% year as we had this year. But you know what? 25% a year from NASPASS is nice enough. That automatically adds 7 or 8% to the top 40. Boom, we start our year nice. So NASPASS doesn't stress me in the least. And then Bitcoin. <clears throat> so really, there's only two words for Bitcoin. One is bubble and the other is tears. It is a bubble. It will end in tears. I want to preface this by saying that just because something is a bubble is no comment on the underlying technology. I'm not interested in the debate about cryptocurrency and about blockchain and all of that. Amazon.com in 1999 was a bubble stock. It crashed, and today it's the second or third largest company in the world. So this chart is out of date because I actually took this this morning at 6 o'clock, and it was uh, 14,000, and now it's 15,000. Um, this is a bubble. The thing with bubbles is there's vast amount of money to be made. But if you don't get out, it'll end in tears. And I mean proper, proper tears. How high does Bitcoin go? I don't know. Maybe 15000 maybe maybe $100,000 a coin, maybe a million dollars a coin. What I do know is that it's going to collapse by 99.99% and the vast majority of people will end up losing money. And then the dust can settle and we can move on. Should you own Bitcoin? Moin, that's on your head. But certainly, please don't put your grannies into it. Okay, so those were the big questions. So let's get to the 2018 predictions. There's really only one issue that matters. One of those seven people will be the new president of the ANC in the next 13 days. 
uh, not the man in the glasses. He's already president of the ANC. One of the other seven will be the president of the ANC. That elective conference, the, the, the voting will happen on the 20th, which is a Wednesday, 13 days from today. To my mind, there are really three outcomes. Sora Mopoza wins. Nkosazana Glamini Zuma wins. Or the conference doesn't happen. It is disrupted. The other players are sweet and all, but they're players. There's, there's only two. If we look at the numbers right now circulating in the press, it is frankly a, a, it's a coin toss between Nkosazana Glamini Zuma and Sora Mopoza. And a lot of it's been misrepresented. They're telling, the media is telling us how many branch nominations they have. They're not telling us how many delegates each branch has, because depending on your branch size depends on the number of delegates. And then, of course, each of the three leagues, veterans, women and youth, get 60 votes as well. The uh, ANC, sorry, uh, NEC gets a vote each, which is another 86 votes. And then, of course, each of the provinces get 27 votes as well. So there's a lot of unknowns out there. The truth of the matter is we don't know who's going to win. So there are three scenarios. So let's run through them. Sora Mopoza wins. The market loves it. The top 40 goes crazy. We have a center ready like never before. And we probably had 60,000 on the top 40, not the Aussie, before the end of the year. Because the market thinks Sora Mopoza is going to save the day. There is, unfortunately, a small awkward question around Sora Mopoza. Is where has he been for the last five years? Because he was made deputy president of the ANC and the country five years ago in Bloemfontein. Where has he been? I don't know. Tending buffaloes. I'm not sure. <laughs> the point being is that what we think is not important, the market and the international community thinks Sora Mopoza will save us, and he is relatively dynamic. President Zuma, if you listen to him in English, sounds illiterate. If you listen to him in Kosa or Isi Zulu, he is an amazingly dynamic speaker. But when he's speaking in public, he speaks in English. You've got to go to Ngoma or, or, or Nkandla or somewhere to hear him speak in, in Isizulu or, or, or Koza. And, and then he's a massively dynamic speaker. Sora Mopoza, he's okay. So Sora Mopoza is our one bet. Our next bet is Nkosazana Glimini Zuma. And the immediate response is that, that Nkosazana Glimini Zuma is terrible. I disagree. And here's why I disagree. Firstly, where has she been for the last five years? AU. She hasn't been here. What was her last scandal? Yo, Serafina. <laughs> you youngins have no idea what I'm talking about. Go Google it. Her last scandal was Serafina. Uh, Ngema was the chap who was involved. The amount? 12 million rand. <laughs> Amateurs. Um, that was in the early 90s. And I, and I know via connections and stuff that that terrified the heck out of her. What are her two claim to fames? I applied for a passport a few weeks ago, and it took eight days from application to passport in my hand. That was in Kosozana Glimini Zuma, Minister of Home Affairs. The fact that I can't smoke in this building whilst doing a presentation, in Kosozana Glimini Zuma, Minister of Health. She's actually a really, really efficient administrator. She has two problems. One. She is not a dynamic speaker. She is a dead speaker in any language, which is unfortunate. Do you want your politician? Actually, no. I mean, do we really want our politicians dynamic? Because I got one word for you then, or actually two words, orange bigot. <laughs> the other trick is that everyone says that in Kosozo and Glimini Zuma, is going to protect her ex-husband, Jacob Zuma. And that is an idea floated by Peter Bruce about two, two and a half years ago in the business day, where he said that this was going to be uh, uh, Jacob Zuma's cunning plan was to get his ex-wife in to help protect. Maybe, maybe not. Um, the, the bigger cunning plan, from my understanding, was actually that Nkosazana Glimini Zuma was going to be the, 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 the Trojan horse and that uh, Mbete was going to be his actual anointed person. But then she threw him under the bus with a small matter around a secret vote on the, 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 the uh, 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 impeachment of the president. Here's the thing, is that none of those seven people in that photograph are stupid. And even if Nkosazana Glimini Zuma wins on the 20th, she's going to wake up on the 21st and think, I are president. How do I stay being president? Well, I got an election in 2019. Hmm. How do I win that? 
<laughs> uh, Jacob, you better go get looking for a new job. She will bounce him as quickly as Sora Mopoza will. What do politicians want more than anything? Power. Power. That's all they're there for. They want power. What is the biggest hindrance to her staying in power? Jacob Zuma. Is she going to care because he's an ex-husband? Is she going to care because he is the father of some of her children? No. No. No, 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 no. The only difference might be is that at the elective conference in 10, 13 days' time, that is the highest decision-making body of the ANC. In between conferences, it's the NEC. At those conferences, it is the current conference. They can, from the floor, they can recall President Zuma at that conference in 13 days' time. And if Sora Mopoza wins, it might happen as quickly as that. If Nkosazana Glimini Zuma wins, it might take a few weeks. While we quickly arrange, maybe we need to get some tickets to some strange Middle Eastern country or something like that. My argument is quite simple. It doesn't matter who wins. Let's be honest. It's a horrible thing to say, but either of them is better than current President Zuma. And the market will see that. The market will look at it and say, you know what? Lesser of two evils. We'll take it. I'm not concerned who wins. I, I have a preference. But in truth, I think the market says, as long as one of those two wins and we get a sense we have a new president, and President Zuma will not still be president by Easter time, regardless of what happens. Understand the mechanics of it. People have been saying that the ANC must recall President Zuma. They can recall him as president of parliament, of South Africa. They cannot recall him as president of the ANC. There is a disciplinary process. They need six provinces, but it's never going to happen. But now that he's no longer president of the ANC, they can do a Thabo Mbeki on him. Because when Thabo Mbeki was recalled, he was no longer president of the party. Zuma was. He was president of the country. Come 21 December, Zuma's on borrowed time. I think that time won't take more than three or four months at worst. He will be gone, and the market is going to love it. Bull market like you can't imagine. 23% is like warming up. So what's my third scenario? Third scenario is collapse conference, which is a disaster of epic proportion. None the least being because if you read the ANC constitution, there is no come that when, when, when this elective conference starts, there are no elected bodies anymore. There's one body which now runs, which is that conference. And when that conference ends, the elected officials now take over. If that conference doesn't end and those elected officials aren't elected, there is no structures within the ANC. Now, they will make a hack, but moin. So when that happens, if we have a collapsed conference, however, i.e. there's no outcome, we wake up on the 21st of December and we don't have a new president of the ANC, our market tanks, but our RAND tanks even more. And what happens when our RAND tanks, and I'm not talking the RAND goes to 1440. I'm talking the RAND goes to 18, 19, 20. What happens when the RAND goes to 18, 19, 20? Our market goes up. Because 75% of our market, of the top 40, earns their money beyond the borders of South Africa. So here's the really curious scenario. We have three potential outcomes. And courses on Glimini Zuma, Sora Mopoza, Collapse Conference, all of them mean market higher. Yeah, only half of you believe me. I know. It's, uh, the mistake you're making, I take that back. The, 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 the process is, is that if we have a collapse conference, SA Inc. will be decimated. But SA Inc. is, I mean, who's SA Inc. in our market these days? Ah, Bid Corp. No, Bid Vest. Some, some, no disrespect to SA Inc., some rats and mouse. 75% of our stock market is not SA Inc. It's World Inc. So yes, that 25% that is SA Inc. will be killed. Our small and mid-cap index will be decimated. But Richmond will go to 160. NASPAS will go to 5,000 and a hop, skip and a jump. Billiton, Anglo, Glencore. Glencore's not in the index. Billiton and Anglo, because with the round of 20, Billiton and Anglo will add 30% in a week or 10 days. I'm not saying it's going to be nice. Don't get me wrong. It's going to be terrible living in South Africa with the collapsed ANC conference, but the market will go higher. <clears throat> and we'll be making money, unless we're short, which would be the wrong place to be.
So my view is quite simple. We have an elective conference, something will happen, probably it'll be good for the stock market. My view is it'll be between Kosozana Gmini Zuma and Sora Maposa. And at this point, if I had to put 12 cents on it, and I stress just 12 cents because I'm stingy, probably Cyril, but frankly, it's a coin toss. It's that close. I'm not stressed if Nkosuzana Glamini Zuma wins. I think that'll be fine in time. She's less tainted. I don't buy the story that she will protect Jacob Zuma. And the fact that she's not an articulate politician at the podium really doesn't bother me. I wanted to be a useful politician, and she has proved that she is. Something which Sora Maposa has not proved. So that's my first story. I am bullish for our top 40 for 2018, almost regardless what happens. There is, however, a small matter of a ratings downgrade coming in February, just after the budget. Uh, and pretty much whoever wins, are they going to be able to pull the rabbit out of the hat to basically fill a 50 billion rand shortfall that we have expected for our budget in February of next year. It doesn't matter who your budget minister is, uh, whether it's Kagaba, whether it's whether we get, I mean, it really, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. It could be me. Your 50 billion is not going to be found in, in a hurry. Um, will Moody's downgrade us? Um, so if we get collapse conference guaranteed, if we don't get a collapse conference and we pull a rabbit out of the hat, maybe. I think if we get a, 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 a Ramaposa on Corsos on Glamini Zuma, I think they will stay their hand. But then we've got to actually make it work. How do we find $50 billion? Sorry, Rand. Fortunately, it's only Rand. Ironically, that's only half of what Steinhoff needs, eh? <laughs> Yeah, hey, suddenly 50 billion is like petty cash. I mean, Marcus Juster, uh, Christa Wies has probably got it in a suitcase somewhere. <laughs> VAT. The only way that you make a difference <coughs> in a 50 billion shortfall is VAT. And we have at 14% actually a fairly low VAT rate. In parts of the world, UK is 20 odd. We have a relatively low VAT rate. <laughs> The problem is a year before an election, VAT, ouch. Trick is that uh, the SACP don't like the ANC anymore and Kasatu don't like the ANC anymore and, and uh, uh, AMCU never liked the ANC in the first place and Farvi's new union, I mean, the, the, the workers don't like the ANC anymore anyway. The simple way you do VAT is you zero rate a lot more. So currently fresh vegetables, brown bread, milk, I think that's about it, maize meal maybe, zero rated. You expand that zero rated basket for more impact onto the poor so that the poor people are basically exempt from the VAT process. The rich people, us rich folks, benefit from as well. It's going to be a tough call, but I honestly think, you know, if you raise, if you add two rand to petrol and five rand to whiskey and 10 rand to cigarettes and you make a new tax rate of 50% and you make the dividend withholding tax 30% and you blah, 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 that gets you to about 38 billion. Yeah, still short. VAT, you add 2% to VAT, 42 billion, problem largely solved. I think, I think that if whoever wins the vote in two weeks' time, if they want to prove they're serious, the best way to prove it is VAT. I think we might get it. And let's be honest, 2% on VAT is nasty, but it's not the end of the world. It's, you know, not to us. It's nasty to poor people. For them, it is really, really nasty. But you can zero rate that. I think we might get a VAT increase in February. Um, you know, and our last VAT increase was 1992. Yeah, nine, was it 92? We went from 10 to 14. And I remember the horror. The world was going to end. And here we are. The RAND... Stronger. So if cancelled conference, which I do not think is what's going to happen, then all bets off, Rand goes to 20. If we get a winner in two weeks' time, Rand goes stronger. I've been calling for a stronger Rand for a couple of years. I've been right some years, wrong others. It's really, really quite simple. What drives our Rand? If, if foreigners want to buy our assets, before they can buy our assets, they have to buy our Rand. If we have a successful elective conference and suddenly SA Inc. stocks are hot, foreigners, in order to buy SA Inc. stocks, need to buy RANDs first. Then they can buy SA Inc. If they want to buy NASPAS, they've first got to buy RANDs. If they want to buy Discovery, they've first got to buy RANDs. 
And if we look at that chart, and those lines are random. I mean, I'm no, I'm not for the moment suggesting that I have special power of drawing lines on charts. That is not my skill set. My niece is very good at it. She's seven years old. She's crayons. She loves lines on charts. But the point is, we can see the we, we can broadly see a range, and we can see the strength. And where does the rand go to? I mean, long term, this rand can go back to ten or nine. And here's a thought: Someone said to me in a WhatsApp group the other day, the rand goes to seven. My knee-jerk response is, "You are crazy." And then I thought back: that spike there in 2001 was 1361. Where did it get to? 575. More than 50% strengthening. If we take that spike at 16 and we more than 50% strengthen it, we are in seven land. It's not impossible. It will, however, happen slowly. From there to there was a period of about four and a half years to get to that point there. It's going to happen slowly. I'm still looking for a stronger rand. And therefore, I'm looking for a stronger market with the caveat that the stronger rand is going to take some of the shine off it, certainly on the 75% offshore part. But again, if we look at that rally there, that little bit of the 07 rally, that rally happened whilst the rand was strengthening to 575. It just means that if the rand hadn't been strengthening, that rally would have been sharper and more exciting. That was driven by commodity prices. The red circled part there is the three and excuse me, half-year bear market, sideways market that we had. In essence, that is a correction in time. What I mean by that, markets go sideways, earnings increase, valuations go down, markets get cheaper. Earnings increased over that three and a half years, let's say 30%, not per year in total, which means we've had a 30% correction in value. The other way markets correct is what happened there in 08, where they just fall off the edge. I prefer the fall off the edge. In truth, the Time is much better because fall off the edge tends to create panic, and that's bad for all sorts of things. But what happens when a market corrects in time is the longer the correction happens, the more certain you are that that break will be up. And so it happened this year, our market broke up. Assuming a successful ANC elective conference in two weeks' time, and assuming a stronger rand, but a stronger rand that by the end of next year might be 12, I'm certainly not saying 10, 8, 9 by next year. At the end of next year, at best 12 to the dollar, I'm saying the bull market continues. The top 40 index is higher in 2018. I said earlier, are we Brazilian? And I said I'd come back to it. So this is the chart I showed you last year. And the reason why I showed it to you is because if you want an example of, an, of a country in a tough space that looks like us, it's Brazil. How many presidents have they put in jail now? Is it just one or is it now two? Was it one and a half? Anyway, they, they keep on throwing presidents in jail. Um, they got downgrade, 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 down. I mean, they got everyone. I mean, everyone, you know, Moody's, like even Moody's downgraded them. Like there was no stay the thing, anything. And uh, look what happened. Uh, it went, it was 40,000 at the peak at the trough. Boom, 60,000. Now 73,000. That star there is last year. Why? Because markets don't care. Markets don't care who's in charge of your country. Markets don't care about politics. If markets cared about politics, the American stock market would have collapsed in the last year. Orange bigot and all. The FTSE would have got found a hole in the floor and crawled into it. Brexit. Markets don't care. Markets care about a risk-adjusted return. What do we think the risk is and can the return compensate? Brazil, bond yields, 9.5%. Okay, so I borrow money in America at half a percent. I put a RAND hedge on that costs me 1.5%, and I earn 9.5%. I get 7% risk-free. I'll take that. Ergo, market's higher. Brazilian real, stronger. People are still buying our bonds. In fact, the last bond auction we had the other week was the most oversubscribed bond auction ever. Why? Because it was also the highest level we'd ever priced them at. And markets were like, you're going to give me nine and a quarter percent for 30 years? Yes, please, I'm there. Governments don't default. Back in the 70s, they defaulted. And Venezuela defaulted in 2001. And Greece kind of did a haircut. But why don't governments default? Because they own the printing press. Government owes you money? Oh, we haven't got any. Please, sir, wait a moment. We just quickly print up. How many brand? Okay, there we go. Freshly signed for you, sir. What does that do? Leads to inflation, weak currency. What does that do? 
devalues your debt. The days of governments defaulting is like, that's 19... You've got to go read 70s uh, 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 history, economic history, to, to find out defaults. Governments don't default anymore. There's no point. You own... But they used to default because of that quaint idea that for every dollar you had to have an ounce of gold. <laughs> Come on. Be fine with that. Every dollar you just got to have half a Bitcoin, you sort it. Economists looking for 3.7% GDP growth next year, inflation 3.3, that inflation number is a little bit high, but inflation is nice for stock markets. Why? Because company profits increase by inflation plus growth plus efficiencies. Population of 7.7 .7 billion, growth is slowing. South Africa looking at 1.8 GDP, inflation 5.4. That inflation is not a bad number for us. The 1.8 is a terrible number, except that considering what we did this year, last year and the year before, 1.8 is the new winning. I know it's not really, but it is actually. We'll, we'll take it. I'll come to Zimbabwe in a moment. So do we have some green shoots? GDP data Tuesday, quarter on quarter, seasonally adjusted for third quarter of 2017. With a lot of gibberish, basically it means we're looking at the third quarter of this year versus last year. And you adjust for seasons. And we were up, sorry, third quarter, this it's up 2%. Mostly driven by agriculture. Hey, no rocket science, right? A year ago, we had no rain. Now we have rain. Yeah, agriculture's better. We get that. The point is, is that we've seen some glimmer numbers come through. Vehicle sales. And when I say off a low base, I mean those numbers were in the basement. But they ticked up a little. We've seen some retail numbers come through. And you know they were surprisingly good because everyone said, oh, those numbers are being cooked. Well... I mean, I, maybe they are. I, I have no insight into the cookability of retail numbers. Um, so, I, I, you know, either you take them at face value or you hide in your bunker with your uh, uh, pumpkin seeds, water, and bullets. Um, our economy is in, a, is in the dwang, and I'm being polite here because uh, I can't swear. That's Christia's show. Um, economy is in the dwang, but we are slowly – I wrote it for Fun Week. And my point was, is that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and I think it's not a train. I think it's actually a light. I think it's actually the end of the tunnel. Of course, there's always a risk that there's a train around the corner, and that train will come around the corner, and that light will become a train. But the point, the question is, is are we, are we going to do Zimbabwe? No, we're not at that point. And there's a hundred reasons why we're not Zimbabwe. But our economy has bottomed and is now grinding along, the operative word being grinding. And, and a good outcome for the elective conference is great for our stock market, but that doesn't help our consumer a heck of a lot in the immediate. That will start to flow through in 2019, 2021, et cetera, et cetera, as we start seeing growth come through, as we start seeing the benefits of low inflation, interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. So our economy will be better next year, but that's not saying a heck of a lot. Zimbabwe, everyone says, oh, look what happened, Zimbabwe, new leader, should we invest? No. Which part of military coup equals good investment idea? Notwithstanding, the military coup man was the man who's kept the ex-military coup man in, in power for 37 years. He's the one who in 2008, when Morgan Shangara won the election, went to Morgan Shangara and said, you did win, nice, now go home. How is that good for investing? Zimbabwe? No. It's great? No. 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 A, a coup. A military coup is not a good investment option. Said it. So, picking up. Do we get to 2% next year? I don't think so. Maybe 1.8, maybe 1.9, maybe 2%. At absolute best. Better going forward. We will avoid a recession next year. That's easy enough. I think we'll start seeing interest rates coming down at the end of the year. I'm bullish on top 40 your two best picks is the top 50 from core. My preferred is the equal weight. Quick point in the equal weight. If I go back to the earlier slide, ding, 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 ding. Oh, boom, 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 boom. I need a better way to get through here. Yo. You'll note that the equal weight did 13%. The top 40 did 23 dividends reinvested. The reason? NASPAS, Richmond. NASPAS and Richmond added that extra 10% all on their own because NASPAS and Richmond is 35% of that top 40 index. It's only 5% of that index. If we're going to see a more broad-based rally next year and we're going to see SA Inc. doing well, the benefits from NASPAS and Richmond will be reduced. 
they're still going to have good years. But NASPAS, instead of doing 100% next year, will do 25%. And there will be other stocks like maybe Woolies doing 50%. In other words, suddenly it might be the time for equal weight. And maybe I'm just talking my book because I own a lot of equal weight. Industrials. So industrials are going to start happening. Industrials is where SA Inc. sits. The problem with our industrial index is that if you think 25% and top 40 is a lot, the industrial index is plus minus 32. And in fact, someone just said to me it's actually 37%. Either way, when you buy the industrial, you're really just buying NASPAS and then you're getting a couple of snacks on the side. My preferred picks there, and that is concentration risk. I have no problem holding NASPAS. I just think, think that putting 30% of your money into any one stock, whatever that stock is, is not a good investment strategy. My preferred there, Richmond, Mr. Price, ShopRite. I think Richmond is currently expensive. Mr. Price and ShopRite, I think, are reasonable value. The construction and manufacturing index are going to continue to struggle. The companies around mining are picking up. We've seen that already. The chemical guys are picking up. Omnia Rolfs, notwithstanding their inability to count, are starting to pick up. Construction is really simple. Leave it alone. Financials, I was not expecting a good 2017. They were up 10% as a basket. Many of them are currently at all-time highs, and they have shot the lights out. I thought we would see bad debts grow in financial stocks in 2017. In fact, they went smaller, and the impairment levels on our banks are at record lows. I thought we would get impairment levels up around 1.3, 1.4%, maybe even 1.5%. Instead, impairment levels down at 0.5%. Why? because banks got nervous and stopped lending. Well, they would lend to you, but you know, for FICA, they actually want you to physically bring your great-grandmother. Oh, and, and when we said we want proof of residence, you know that, that joke on the interwebs? We want you to bring your house too. Like we want to hold your house and then we'll lend you 20. They just clamp down. They don't have bad debts. They've got incredibly strong balance sheets. The Basel III requirements, which are phasing in over the next couple of years, our banks already exceed those Basel III requirements. Our banks are cheap. Basically, pick a big bank. The better two, probably FNB and Standard Bank, but in truth, Barclays, what are they called? Are they still Barclays? Or are they ABSA? Whoever they might be. Um, uh, should we call them what they really are? Amalgamated Banks of South Africa or Nedbank as good. Capitec, love it, expensive. Steinhoff, the high risk play here. Steinhoff's net asset value is 50 Rand. Last time I checked, the share is 45. In other words, you're buying Steinhoff. Sorry, Sassfin. Sorry, everyone got excited. My bad. I saw an S. I saw an S. Sassfin. Sasfin is trading at discount to net asset value. When Sasfin typically trades at about 1.1 times net asset value, you buy it ungeared, you hold it for a year, year and a half, it goes to one and a half times net asset value, which is increased, you get dividends, you typically get yourself about a 40% a year return over about a year or two. It's now sitting 10% below net asset value. The trick is liquidity. So like, don't go in there with guns blazing. You go in there with like 12 rand at a time and you're very, very carefully. Uh, Signia, well positioned. What's the story with Signia? At 24 rand, Signia was just insanely priced. The market was welcome to it. What's happened now? Firstly, Signia doesn't earn performance fees. But what Signia does earn is they just take a small percentage of everyone's portfolio. And if the market is going up, well, they take a little bit more. And with the acquisition of Deutsche Bank and their new ETFs, what they were doing is they were putting a competitor's ETF in their fund and paying money to a competitor. Now they put their ETF in a fund and they earn that money. Signia is never going to be a coronation, but it's a nice little business, reasonably valued. Resource stocks. The key point in resource stocks is we're in equilibrium. In, 20, in 2007, we had oversupply on commodities of every commodity possible. There was oversupply. Ultimately, that oversupply overwhelms the price and price collapses. That's what happens. But then what happens is that oversupply gets removed from the market. But commodities are slow because you don't just shut down a mine. That mine took seven years and 10 billion rand to build, or in the case of Anglo, 10 years and 10 billion dollars to build. In the case of Sasso, 11.3 billion to build. It's a slow process. So they ramp up slowly and they ramp down slowly. But mostly, with the exception being platinum, what we find is a equilibrium in commodities. So what's the driver? There is no China. China has happened. That, gi that driver gi China driver is over. But broadly, the world needs 
commodities. And if the world's going to grow at three plus percent, there's demand for commodity. Not enough to show to give us the super commodity cycle we had from 2000 to 07, but enough to keep it ticking along and going. Any of the big diversified is probably a good bet there. Uh, Platinum is going to struggle and no one cares about gold anymore. Because Bitcoin. Bitcoin is your new gold, guys. Retailers, they had a tough 2017. Again, I'm being polite. If we get the right process, we're going to see starting things start to improve in 2018. Not so much because of consumer pickup. The consumer will pick up, but only a little bit. The key driver is going to be consumer confidence. And we saw it in August when we came out of recession, got an interest rate cut, suddenly big ticket items, big box items had an absolute spike in August retail sales. Not because the consumer was richer, but because the consumer was more positive. So we have a new president, doesn't matter who, the consumer is largely going to say, man, this is good, I need a drink. Oh, while I'm having a drink, why don't I also go and et cetera, et cetera. They're slightly under pressure. Banks might start lending a little bit more money going out there. The key thing what's happened is that these retail stocks, after two or three years of immensely tough times, are lean, mean operating businesses. They have cut the excess out. They have really got themselves into very, very well-functioning places. Notwithstanding, some of them are uh, on the verge of, <laughs> they keep on rushing off to the UK and buying dud assets. Who spends 20 billion on a burger? I mean, I ask you. But if we get the right vote, SA Inc. is flying. These guys are absolutely going to have, they're going to be the drivers of next year. Not at the base level, but just at the efficiency levels. And in fact, 2019 is going to be the really, really good year for the consumer stocks. But a good retail outlet for the 20, uh, uh, 2018. Mr. Price liked them because they haven't gone and bought some overpriced new look operational burger in the UK. Um, they're mostly cash. They come from Durban and they seem to have discovered their mojo. ShopRite because they are a machine. And if you have a portfolio in South Africa and you don't own ShopRite, one word. Why? Why don't you own ShopRite? And at 214 Rand today, it is cheap. Frankly, I think anything under 250. I was buying some today at 208. Thank you, Steinhoff. I don't know. Steinhoff panics. ShopRite goes down. I'll go buy some ShopRite. And then long for life, Brian Joffe. Brian Joffe's making a new bid vest. No, he's not. Firstly, Brian Joffe spent 50 years making bid vest. He's now in his 70s. He doesn't have another 50 years. All the respect in the world, Brian Joffe is going to be at long for life for five or 10 years. But you can craftily see what he's starting to do. He buys Holdsport, a company I got no time for. But what's the one thing Holdsport does? Man, it generates cash. So what does Brian Joffe do? He takes that cash. He doesn't put it back into hold sport. He goes and he spends it elsewhere. Classic Warren Buffett. Capital allocation. He bought Sorbet. I, I have no idea why he bought Sorbet. And then he bought a bottling plant in Joburg, which seemed weird. And then he bought a bottling plant in Cape Town. Contract bottlers. You can see him starting to, you can start to see that thinking coming through. Now, buying a bottler in Cape Town is weird. No water, but, you know. It'll rain, hey? Eventually, it has to rain. Um, but you can start to see that strategy. Now, suddenly, he's got a bottler in Joburg and a bottler in Cape Town, contract bottler. Pepsi, anybody? You can start seeing one of the smartest entrepreneurs in South Africa's brain starting to work. And at 4 and 70, you've got a cash underpin of about a buck 80. You've got a whole sport underpin of about 3 rand. And then you've got the bottlers and the long for life. You're buying below net asset value at the 4 and 80 level. Interest rates coming down at the second half of next year. Europe going nowhere because Super Mario and US continuing to move higher because, well, that's what they're doing. Uh, the new man, I forget his name, Powell. Um, will, they'll continue their slow, 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 slow move forward. Ultimately, rates higher, bad for stock markets because you can go and get your money in a, put your money in the bank and earn there risk free. But understand that globally, rates are, are 100 miles from being normalized. Never mind being high. China, China's happening. Now, the one thing I missed this year was the horror stories about the Chinese ghost towns. 
or the Bears used to tell me about it. What China's doing is they're trying to move a billion people from poverty in the, in the rural areas into the cities. They've already moved about 400 million, and they've got another 600 million to go, and it'll take about 15 years. The thing with China, and it's part of the strength of Tencent, understand, is that China's quasi-capitalism, but with some oaks in charge, you say, do that. Like they want to build a dam, and there's 100,000 people who live there, they say, move. And 100,000 people move because, you know, when the Chinese man says move, you move because you know what happens if you don't. So it's that quasi-capitalism with the regulation. Now, ethically, deeply dodge. The point is, it is working. They're moving from an industrial economy to a consumer economy, and we can see it happening. Those ghost towns that exist, yes, there are ghost towns, dozens of them. Why? Because you've got to build it first. You can't go to a squatter camp or a shanty town and build a town. You build a town and people will come. Infrastructure you have to build in advance. Kucha, et cetera, et cetera. You have to build it in advance. China has built it. Why? Because they're China. They want money, they go print it. They want to build a city, they build it. No one lives there for 15 years. They're like, yeah, but they're coming. We've got 600 million people. They're coming. This in our lifetimes. It's going to be the biggest economy on planet Earth. Currently, number two. USA, monster year. Tax cuts, trickle down is a lie. The fact that, so we now know, because Reagan did the tax cut, right? And we can see what happened posted. All the stuff that Trump is promising us from the tax cut is what Reagan promised, and we know it did not work. We know because CEOs are saying, if you cut our corporate tax rate, are we going to employ more people? Don't be stupid. We're going to buy our share back, boost the share price, and get more bonuses. It's called capitalism. Be that as it may, the big trick here is that the rally will slow. The U.S. is not going to do another 20%. There is our rally. It steps up another year. It goes a bit higher. That is the only bigger one, and we're a long way to get to it. The big risk to my bullish view for 2018 is this rally ends. And what makes the stock market rally end? Something, which in hindsight we can all point to, but in advance, if this rally ends, we don't have a bullish 2018. The planet doesn't have. The, the world will follow the US stock market. If the US stock market, and I'm not saying if it peters and goes slowly, that's fine. If this thing goes bear market or goes crash at us, we go crash too. So we have now two risks. Disrupted elective conference, highly unlikely. U.S. crash, unlikely but not impossible. That is our risk. And it will be so tragic because like we just get to bull market stage. And then the U.S. crash, oh, we go down with it. European Union, actually looking quite strong. I expect it to do better. <clears throat> it's still got QE. I think it to do better than... <clears throat> Then the U.S. going forward, low rates will continue, quantitative easing will continue. Uh, European Central Bank is a large shareholder in Steinhoff. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but great fun. And then Brexit, it's just a mess, and I'm being polite again. There are a lot of nice, cheap-looking companies there like Capco and others. Leave them. They're going nowhere. The island will still be there in five years' time. Let the English sort out the mess that they've made. Um, so... 2018, and I have 45 seconds. I am bullish SA Inc. Top 40, I preferred Indy, I like, but I don't like that concentration on NASPAS, so top 40 is preferred. The RAND, if my theory plays out, will dull it, but I still think we can have a totally winning year. US remains economy of note, but EU, I think, is going to do better, and I think we'll start seeing a better, stronger market from DAX, uh, Kakaron, et cetera, et cetera. South Africa will have a new president in 2018. That is my ETF stock pick for next year's core shares equal weight. And if you want spice, the mid cap. Your mid cap is basically SA Inc. So if my theory plays out and SA Inc's doing well, mid cap's going to be the place to be. Uh, ShopRite, Mr. Price, long for life. Signia, Satrix Finney, which is just a lazy way to get exposure to the banks, go and buy the ETF. Sasfin, Bulletin for commodities. And as always, keep your ETFs and max out your tax-free accounts. So short version, bullish. Three years in a row, I've told you that these folks were going to come to Northern Cape and set a land speed record. Three years in a row, they haven't. Maybe they will next year. Uppington, October. I'm renting a house. If you want, you can come rent a room. Oh, no, I lie. You can rent a bench. 
and lots of oaks are going to come. That man is going to go 1,600 kilometers an hour. He has the new F-Type Jag. He has two F-Type Jaguar engines in his car to pump fuel to make the engine go fast. I am not a car nerd. I care nothing about cars. But man, that well, that's not a car, right? It's a rocket. So that's the thruster one, which when I was a boy, which excited me. This is the new one. That, that's a rocket. But anyway, that's happening in the Northern Cape in, well, I don't know, last year, next year, some year. Apparently, they will come. And then two last slides. Contacts, legal stuff. <coughs> yeah. A personal note for me, but incredibly important for everyone in the room here. Earlier this year, my wife found a lump in her breast, breast cancer. Found early, operated, cancer gone, now doing post-surgery uh, treatment. Point is, cancer is indiscriminate. There is a test for your age and your gender. Do it. It doesn't, it might be awkward. It might not be fun. It might not be comfortable. But if you catch it early, it makes a difference. For your age, your gender, do the test. And then 2018. Ladies and gents, I'm now officially on holiday. I overran a minute. I apologize for that. I will finish to say I am bullish, and I hope whether I'm right or wrong, you all make pots and pots of money. Uh, my thanks to Christia, my colleague from Just One Lap. My thanks to JSC. I'm not going to name names because I will forget some names, but they're hiding in the back there. My biggest thanks to all of you for supporting us at the events, for supporting us online, for coming, for commenting, for giving us information, for asking us questions. It keeps us on our toes. It's why we have huge amounts of fun. Uh, I'm on holiday, and I hope you all make truckloads of money next year. Thank you very, very much for your time. <laughs>